Good afternoon. I'm Timothy Carter. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon with the St. Francis Open Heart Surgery Program at Good Samaritan Hospital and the director of the Aortic Center at Good Samaritan Hospital. I'm here today to talk with you about aortic aneurysm and dissection. So starting backwards, an aortic aneurysm is any time we have a patient with a blood vessel that is more than one and a half times its size that it's supposed to be. When we have aneurysms, it increases the pressure or the tension on the wall of the blood vessel, and it makes them subject to tear or to rupture. On the left side of your screen, you can see an aorta with the three layers that normally comprise a healthy blood vessel. In the picture on that left side, there's a small tear on the innermost level that allows blood to travel into the wall of the blood vessel. Once blood enters into the wall of the blood vessel, it can cause it to further rupture or it can cause compromise of blood flow to other parts of the body. This is called an aortic dissection. This is what we're working to try to avoid. On the right side of your screen, you can see the different types of aortic dissection. My area of expertise deals specifically with partial tears or dissections that begin at the heart, at the level of the heart, down by the aortic valve there, and travel down to the level of the diaphragm. I work together with my colleagues in vascular surgery to be able to also treat areas beneath the diaphragm down to the level of the legs. We largely group these into Stanford type A aortic dissection, which is a tear in the first part of the aorta, and a Stanford type B aortic dissection, which is beyond those topmost branches that you see going up to the head and to the arms. When we have an aortic dissection occur, it's a very dangerous event. With optimal surgery in a timely fashion, there remains a 20% risk for dying within the first 24 to 48 hours. In fact, we count the risk for death as increasing with 1% per hour from the onset of the dissection. Without surgery, mortality is greater than 80%. Even with an optimal surgery, when patients leave the hospital, there is a risk of 40% chance of dying within five years or 50% within 10 years, even with optimal therapy. So these are events that we want to improve. The issue here is that despite major advances in the care of patients with aortic dissection, with critical care, with surgical advances, we really have only improved survival by about 10% on a national level. And so the question is, how do we improve this? How can we optimize this? The answer is we stop it from happening in the first place. We want to take this procedure, this problem, and deal with it in an elective fashion instead of an emergency fashion. When a patient comes in with a dissection, they're taken emergently to the operating room, and those patients are typically sick. So if we can identify patients before these events occur, when the aorta is in an aneurysm stage, then we can operate electively, and we can make a much more different outcome for the patient. Dissections, as I said, typically start from aneurysms. But if we can tackle an aneurysm before its dissection in an elective fashion, we know across the United States that the risk of open surgery is around 3%. At our program, our risk is around 1%, which is on par with some of the top institutions across the United States. And this is something that we've been able to leverage because of our expertise in heart care and in cardiovascular care that, through the St. Francis Heart Programs. Looking at an aortic dissection, the question of how do, we, how do we catch these early? How do we correct them? Well, we know looking at patients who have suffered dissections that the risk for having an event occur go, increases with aortic size, and there are two quote unquote hinge points at which the risk for an event jumps significantly. We know that when the first part of the aorta, called the ascending aorta, increases to a size of 5.25 centimeters or up to 5.75, we know that risk jumps. And so what we want to do is we want to find patients with aneurysms that are approximating these size and offer them an elective operation that can be done safely and get them back to a normal, healthy life right away, rather than have one of these emergency interventions occur. And because of our very successful program and our outcomes with how good they are, we're able to offer that at a more aggressive level. Most aortic centers across the nation operate or or have an indication to intervene in healthy patients when the aorta reaches five centimeters. And this is typically when aortic events begin to occur. So we want to try to catch patients early enough to prevent those emergency operations. And we try to make this a customized process because every patient is different. So my aorta is different than someone who is, say, 
you know, five foot seven or someone who is six foot four who has a family history? What sort of valve do they have? What other medical problems do they have? What we want to do is we want to look at each individual patient and we want to take all these different factors to offer an, op an operation at the right time. What is the inflection point for that individual? And that lets us be, have personalized medicine. One of the other things we talk about with that is genetics and family history, which bring a lot to bear on whether or not an event is likely to occur and at what age. Looking specifically at family history, we know that patients who have first degree relatives who have had an aortic dissection are at a six-fold higher risk to have an event themselves in comparison with the general population who does not have a family history. Similarly, for patients with aneurysms, we know that if there is a first degree relative, meaning a, a brother or a sister or a parent, that there is a fourfold higher risk of having an aneurysm. The third thing is we know that aortic valves often come along with, or abnormalities in aortic valves often come along with aortic aneurysms. Bicuspid aortic valves are some of the most common congenital, or meaning from birth, types of valve problems that we see across the world. And we know that these patients are also uh, known to have aortic aneurysms, and they run in families. So it's important to take stock in your own family and for us to look at patients' families to come to know what their risks are and to try to intervene a little bit earlier. Similarly, we've been doing genetic testing. So we've launched a program to do genetic testing because we know that a third of these aneurysms have a familial cause. We presume that they have a genetic predisposition. And we know well within the medical community that there are several syndromic conditions, such as Marfan syndrome, Louis Dietz, EDS, that carry a unique genetic signature and they're passed through families in a dominant mutation, meaning they go from generation to generation. Patients with these syndromic conditions are prone to rupture or to tear at smaller diameters and at younger ages. And so it helps us personalize when the time for surgery is for those patients. And there are also, every day, we're learning more and more about the different genetic causes or triggers that bring about aneurysms and dissections. And it's helping us make a personalized care plan for patients themselves and also for their families. About 70 to 80 percent of these patients have what we call variants of unknown significance. These are single mutations in genes that are not well understood, but they more commonly occur in patients who have aneurysms and dissections. We've developed a multi-institutional collaboration with several other institutions in, to engage in research and to discuss these variants in order to optimize care for our patients here on the island. In a larger sense, taken together with family history and also the patient's medical condition, they help us, again, personalize that trigger to intervene early in a safer fashion. Another cornerstone of our aortic program is advanced imaging. We've developed dedicated protocols with CAT scanning, with cardiac MRI, and with ECHO so that we're compliant and reading in accordance with the guidelines from the American Heart Association with how we measure aortas. And we do this by shrinking the pool, by all being on the same page from the radiologist to the surgeon to the cardiologist with how we measure things and how we capture those images so that we know that we're comparing apples and apples every year when we're surveilling or watching these aneurysms for any signs of growth. This is also taken together with a history and physical exam. Um, we pay careful attention to things like height, body size, body habitus, skeletal features, things like scoliosis, hyperflexibility, changes to the eye and the ear that go along with issues with collagen. The same collagen of different types that's in other parts of our bodies is also in our blood vessels. And genetic abnormalities or unknown abnormalities in collagen are probably what's driving most of these problems. At the aortic center, we're able to put this together into an easy package for patients. Many of our patients are, lead very busy lives. They're working, they have children, they're taking care of parents and other family members. To try to organize all of these different components is difficult for people to do that. And we've tried to simplify that. What we bring through the aortic center is a one-day process where patients can come in the door in the morning, they can get the imaging procedure that they need with no need for separate lab testing. They can meet with a genetic counselor and start the process of genetic testing and also meet with our cardiac surgical and vascular surgical teams so that we can use the information gained on that day to develop a care plan for both surveillance 
and also, if need be, surgery or further family screening on, on that day that the patient has decided to give us to help organize their care. This streamlined approach has made it much easier for patients to follow up in a timely fashion, which encourages further follow-up, and also to make sure that we're touching all the bases so we can provide the most comprehensive care package for that individual. We also know that patients who have survived aortic dissection, there's much that we can do to improve their longevity and their quality of life, and that means they need to continue to be watched. Through our center, we're able to follow aortas, or dissected aortas, before or after surgery, or those who have been managed medically, to look for problems that are occurring so that we can intervene before they become an emergent, an emergent issue. We know that with proper screening, we can do, tackle these issues in a non-emergent way, and that allows us to do so safer and with less impact on their functional status and their ability to carry on life in a normal way. In doing so, we've chosen to follow the guidelines of the AHA and the, CD, the uh, ACC to build a screening platform that both works for that patient and also is providing best care for patients who are survivors of aortic disease. To change that statistic, meaning that patients now, we know that 60% of procedures after a dissection occur are also in an urgent emergent fashion. And this is room for us to improve on a national level. And here at the Aortic Center, we're looking to do that on the local level. This is a protocol that we follow, it's just an example, but it's how we follow our patients from beginning to end. Essentially, I tell my aortic patients that we're gonna see each other every year for the rest of their life because they have me and my team available to watch their, watch their back and keep them safe to make sure that we don't have anything brewing that needs to be dealt with. And if it does need to be taken care of, we're gonna do that too and we're gonna do so in a safe way. Finally, it's time to operate. So when we have issues that do need surgical intervention, we've been able to bring already our high level of ability with classic open surgical approaches, but also to look at how we can do this in a less invasive way, whether that be endovascular with no incisions at all, or through a hybrid approach that offers less invasive operations and a shorter recovery. Another area that's of great interest to me is uh, care of the young patient with aortic disease and with aortic valve disease. As I mentioned previously, aortic valve disease and aneurysm often go hand in hand. While we have great options for replacing valves, uh, whether it be with a pig or a cow valve, which is called a bioprosthetic valve, those valves don't need anticoagulation, or if it needs a mechanical valve, these are all great options. But we always like to save a patient's native valve if it's healthy. One of the things that we offer is called a valve sparing root replacement, which allows us to keep the patient's native valve and simply replace the aneurysm and rebuild the valve within, as you can see in the picture on the right side of your screen. The other option that we've brought is something called a Ross procedure. In this procedure, the pulmonary valve is removed and it's transposed into the aortic position and a donor valve is then used to replace the pulmonary valve. This is the only method of aortic valve re replacement that we know of that returns life expectancy to the normal patient without any evidence of valvular heart disease. It does not need blood thinners and it most closely mirrors the normal physiology. We know this to be the most durable valve option outside of a mechanical valve, and it's something that we now offer within our health system, which really brings us to the cutting edge of care in, in valve disease. Looking at these patients, you can see in the graph on the right that they, their survival and their functional status most closely mirrors the normal healthy population. And this is a picture um, that shows the the pulmonary valve having been moved over into the aortic position, and we can see that it is almost indistinguishable from the native aortic valve from birth. In summation, through a personalized approach to medical care we're, and these advanced surgical therapies, we're achieving better results for our patients with enhanced length and quality of life. And in doing so, we really feel like we're doing the right thing for Long Island here, improving the care of patients with aortic disease here in our neighborhood. So who should be evaluated in the aortic clinic? In general, we follow patients with thoracic aortic aneurysms that are larger than four centimeters in diameter, patients who have had previous aortic dissection with or without surgery, and this applies to patients with those descending or type B aortic dissections in the lower half of the aorta, patients with abnormal heart valves called bicuspid valves also associated with enlarged aortas, patients with a family history of aortic aneurysm or dissection, and patients who have any signs or clinical features of connective tissue disease. 
I want to thank you very much for your attention and encourage you, if you would like more information, to please visit us on the web at www.chsli.org slash good-samaritan-hospital. Thanks very much for your time.